Okay, thank you and welcome to Tuesday Topics. Um, this is our third virtual Tuesday Topics. We're very honored to have Diana Carlin as our speaker today. Uh, Diana Carlin is Professor Emerita of Communication and former Associate Provost at St. Louis University. She's also spent 24 years at KU in the Communication Studies Department and served seven years as Dean of the Graduate School and International Programs. Her research and teaching interests are in political communication with an emphasis on women in politics, political campaigns, debates, and presidential speeches. She taught two courses at KU that included a history of women's suffrage, and she has taught a course on suffrage for KU's Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. She frequently lectures on the topic, especially during the 100th anniversary celebration. So join me in welcoming Diana Carlin. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. And I want to thank Glennie. It was so nice to see Glennie and I had Topeka Public School experience many years ago. So I appreciate the invitation from Glennie and thank you all for being here. Um, we were talking before about the vote, which is on PBS last night and tonight. And if you didn't get a chance to watch last night, go ahead and watch tonight. And then if you belong, you can always get it streaming. But um, a lot of, you know, I learned, I saw the preview of it about a month ago, and I still caught some things last night that I had missed the first time. I got interested in this topic when I was an undergraduate at KU, and one of my professors had written his dissertation on Anna Howard Shaw. And he started the first women's studies course at KU in the late 60s. So it took a man to start women's studies, but you know, that's sort of the way things go some of the time. And so he really got me fascinated by these women who I had never heard of. And so then when I began uh, doing a lot of research and teaching at KU on women in politics, I had to include the suffragists in it. And that just sort of snowballed and Grace Wilson took uh, my Osher class, uh, which is uh, used to be six hours, but we were down to four and a half. There's no way in 30 minutes I can cover everything, so I'm just going to try to do some highlights today. And if you have a question, uh, you can uh, type it in the chat box and I'll find it, or you can, we'll use the raise hand or you can just wave your hand and I'll unmute you. So we'll find some ways, but if you do have, you don't want to forget it, go ahead and just type it in the chat box and we'll come back and maybe Mary and uh, Vicki, you can help me find those there. So let me share my screen. And get this started, slideshow. Okay, I call this the long road to the 19th Amendment because it certainly did take uh, most of 100 years uh, from the time that women really became active until this started, until we had the, the 19th Amendment. I'm going to cover about five different things. Um, what what were the barriers that kept women from participating in the public space and being part of this public forum to actually discuss the issue? Who were some of those early advocates for women's rights? Uh, spending a little bit of time about some of the leaders of Seneca Falls and then what happened uh, beyond those leaders. A few things on Kansas because we were certainly one of the bellwether states in all of this. And then talking about some of the divisions within the ranks and the compromises that it took to get the vote. So there were quite a few barriers to women being able to participate in the public sphere in politics. First, there were religious barriers and all the religious leaders starting in the 16th and 17th century in colonial America really believed that women had no right to advise men, that they had no right to speak out in churches. They cited uh, St. Paul, 1 Corinthians, uh, let your women keep silence in the churches. And then Cotton Mather, who was one of the, the major Puritan speakers, some of you can probably remember that from history, wrote a, a little booklet called Ornaments for the Daughters of Zion or the Character and Happiness of a Virtuous Woman. And he outlined in the 17th century what women should and should not do. And basically they should be quiet, they should be subject to their husbands, they should be good wives, they should be good mothers. And that was what would make them happy. In addition to religious barriers, education was another one. Women certainly didn't have access to much education. They couldn't go to college, that was for sure. Um, and 
most women, even elite women, didn't have a lot of education other than what tutors or their mothers provided in homes. And mothers were certainly the first teachers. So they had very limited background. They weren't allowed into the law. And that was one way that a lot of men got involved. So there were educational barriers. Then of course, political bar barriers, virtually no rights. And that was one of the important points that they made last night on the vote, is that when women married, they virtually as had no rights. And Susan B. Anthony explained that she never got married because if she got married, she was civilly dead. Uh, because she couldn't own property, she couldn't vote, she couldn't sign a contract. There was absolutely nothing that she could do legally. Culturally, we also had barriers. And this was one thing they talked a lot about on the vote last night, was this very clear division that really didn't happen until after the Revolutionary War, when they developed this idea of Republican motherhood and wifehood, and that the way women were to take part in the Republic was to be good wives, and good mothers. And before that, you really didn't have this real clear division of domestic and public spheres. Women were far more active in, in some things. In fact, there were, were some of the early on, there were opportunities where some women actually voted at town meetings in, in the uh, early, or in the 18th and early 19th century. That was eventually taken away as this division became clearer. Women were also, because of this division of spheres, viewed as very, from a very sentimental and ornamental sort of perspective. Women were seen as better than men and to become involved in politics, they would simply sully this good nature that they had and they were on pedestals and if they got in the middle of all of this, especially when votes were bought with alcohol uh, or whatever else, that you, you just would then be as, like a man, you would be as corrupted and so we would keep these women pure. And then they considered public speaking to be an unnatural act, that it was just something that women really weren't capable of doing, and it didn't look or sound right uh, to have women speaking. And for those of us who are old enough and can remember when it was only male voices on the radio or television, when we, we had the first women who began being announcers, especially on radio, it was sort of a shock to the system. So think about it, if you've never seen a woman up in front of an audience, this seemed like a very unnatural type of thing. So there were also a lot of anti-suffrage arguments and these went from the beginning to the end of the movement. And one of the things they did talk about in the, uh, the vote last night was the formalization of the anti-suffrage movement. There were a lot of arguments that women didn't want to vote, and later on in the process, they, they cited some badly done polls. Women didn't need to vote because men took care of them, and if they did have the vote, they'd simply vote the way their husbands told them to vote, so you wouldn't have any difference in the outcome. Uh, women enjoy their nonpartisan influence, and you know it's, there are some real advantages, as the League knows, of being nonpartisan, but that doesn't mean that you can't also have the vote. Uh, that they're going to remove these natural differences between the sexes. And this gets back to the corruption and women be more empathetic and caring. And that if you get into this mix of ugly politics, you're going to become more like men. And this become a, became an argument also against the ERA later, that if we began uh, giving, if we formalized equal rights, then women would be drafted. They'd have to serve in foxholes. You'd have unisex bathrooms and all these natural differences and natural advantages that women might have would go away. And also that it would begin disrupting families. And there were some great cartoons they showed last night about the men taking care of the children while the woman was out voting, um, that it was going to disrupt family life. And that it's the ballot isn't an effective cure-all and it's not going to change a lot of the problems in society if women vote. So they had to deal with those arguments. So who were some of these early advocates? Everybody tends to think of the movement for the vote as starting in 1848 with Seneca Falls and the Declaration of Sentiments. But I would argue it was much earlier than that for women's rights. And one of the first was Abigail Adams. She really wanted her husband to do the right thing because they were very much equal partners. And she was probably more astute politically than John Adams was. And if he'd listened to her a little more, he might have been a better politician, might have won a second term. But she talked about the independency and she had her famous line, um, remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, 
We are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. And she was very prescient on that because we eventually did get to that point where it took some civil disobedience uh, and disobeying the law with even voting when it was illegal. So basically Abigail said, either give us the rights now or here's what you're gonna face. And she was right. But there, was, there were also women who dared to speak out uh, 20 years before Seneca Falls. Frances Wright is probably the first woman to formally give speeches in the United States and to what they call the promiscuous audience, which was both men and women. She was Scottish and she read Jefferson's uh, Declaration of Independence. She was an abolitionist in the UK and came to the US as an abolitionist to see what she might learn and to see what lessons from the Declaration of Independence might help the abolitionist movement. So she began speaking out, but she not only spoke about abolition, but she also talked about the fact that women were not much better than slaves because they had no rights. So she toured the US, went as far west as Ohio, and spoke out on women's rights and the importance of women being educated and of women having a voice in government. So 20 years before Seneca Falls, she was out there. Another um, early speaker was a free African-American woman named Maria Miller Stewart. And there's a picture of her. Uh, she had been educated as a free woman up in the North, uh, originally from Connecticut and then moved to, uh, moved to Massachusetts. But she wrote uh, various documents also, and this is one example. But she was a native of Connecticut, moved to Boston, married. She was widowed very early. And she, she connected with William Lloyd Garrison, and he was incredibly important to the suffrage movement. Uh, there were a lot of men who were important to the suffrage movement, and they need to get a lot of the credit too, and Garrison was one. He was an abolitionist, but put women into the program equally with men and he gave her opportunities to become a public speaker. So four years after um, Fanny Frances Wright showed up in the US and two years after she went back to Scotland, you have Maria Miller Stewart who's starting to speak. And she originally gave her speeches both about abolition and women's rights uh, to African-American women. And then a few months later, she spoke to both men and women. And then by 1833, she was speaking to both men and women and whites and blacks. She's not in our history books, but an incredible early adopter of women's rights and the women's right to vote, who should be in our history books much more prominently. Sojourner Truth, somebody we have heard about. Sojourner Truth, whose original name, or her slave name was Isabella Bomfrey, uh, was very famous for her Ain't I a Woman speech. And she was at some of the, the national conferences after Seneca Falls in the early 1850s, where she was there along with a lot of other Afri free African-American women who were part of the early movement after Seneca Falls. And her Ain't I a Woman speech is, is one that we do learn about in history. And what's interesting, if you Google that speech, you're gonna find a couple versions of it. Uh, one of the versions is the one that we have heard the most about, and it's given in what would have been considered, you know, an African-American Southern kind of dialect. But there were people who were there who argued that that wasn't the way she spoke and it wasn't the way it was given, that the grammar was very different. And so there was somebody who took notes, and there is another version online of the way that they claim that it should have been recorded historically. And that's one of the problems with history before you had recording devices, is you had to have people taking this down in longhand, and who knows if, how much they really got done accurately. Two of the very important early speakers, also from the William Lloyd Garrison shop, were Angelina and Sarah Grimke. And if any of you have read the Sue Monk Kid book, The Invention of Wings, it's about the Grimke sisters who were originally raised on a South Carolina plantation. Their father was a, a lawyer, a judge, and he educated his daughters up until the point of college because they couldn't go, uh, as well as the sons. Sarah eventually, uh, they both began questioning the institution of slavery and Sarah joined Quakers in South Carolina because they were abolitionists and she moved to Philadelphia and then Angelina followed her. They also worked with Garrison and they were among the first of his speakers to begin promoting women's rights. 
and they were the first women to join his American Anti-Slavery Society. Angelina wrote an appeal to Christian women of the South on abolition, and then Sarah wrote a, a treatise called Letters on the Equality of the Sexes. So they were two very, very important women who were out speaking 10, 12 years, once again, before Seneca Falls. And uh, they started speaking in churches, started speaking originally to women. They were not welcomed in Philadelphia uh, after a certain time because they were challenging the social norms and they also started speaking to men. So they moved to New York. They gave some speeches in Massachusetts and the congregational ministers issued a document condemning them, not by name, but by action and basically talked about this unnatural act of women being out speaking in front of audience, especially male and female, and how the world was basically going to come to an end if we had women speaking in public, or if we began to give women these rights. So they kind of took a lot of the, the Cotton Mather ideas from 120, 130 years before and continued to, uh, to uh, support those, those ideals. Uh, Angelina was the, the better speaker, Sarah the better writer of the two, but they both were, were good at both. The Quaker women were incredibly important to the movement, and there was a reason why there were so many Quaker women, and that was because Quakers didn't have ministers. They had meeting houses, and anyone could speak out in a meeting house. Men and women were treated as eight equals within the Quaker community, so a lot of these early leaders were used to public speaking because they spoke out in meeting houses. They were used to equality. And they pointed out in, uh, in the vote last night that Alice Paul, who was also a Quaker because she'd gone to Quaker schools, by the time she finally left Quaker schools and got out into a more general public from her kind of rarefied existence, she was just shocked to find out that women were not treated the same way that they had been within her Quaker community. So in addition to Lucretia Coffin Mott and her sister Martha Coffin Mott, and Lucretia was one of the founders of the Seneca Falls Convention along with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was not a Quaker, and Jane and Richard Hunt. Uh, and Stanton worked with these three Quaker uh, partners, uh, married couples, three married couples, to get Seneca Falls off the ground and to really begin starting the, the movement. And then Susan B. Anthony was a Quaker who joined later. Abigail Kelly Foster and her husband Stephen, not the musician, and then Alice Paul were some of the more well-known Quaker women, but they were really keys to getting this early movement started because they were partners with their husbands who had the money, who had the ability to rent a place to have something like Seneca Falls and other speeches. So Seneca Falls, 1848, the Declaration of Sentiments, which was modeled after the Declaration of Independence, and that listed all of the rights that men were denying women. Elizabeth Cady Stanton is one of the women, along with Lucretia Coffin Mott, who wrote the Declaration of Sentiment. She was influenced by her father, who was a judge, like the Grimke sisters. And what really caused her to become a feminist and a suffragist was when she was a young girl, her father had a client come to his house whose husband had died and he left her penniless. She had inherited land and money, but when she married, it became her husband's. He gambled it, spent it away, he was an alcoholic, and so she's left destitute with children, and she goes to see Elizabeth Cady's father, who said he couldn't do anything to help her because she had no right to that money once she married, and it became her husband's. So later, Elizabeth went in, and she started tearing out pages of his law books that forbade women to own property. And he found her and said, what are you doing? And she said, well, if I tear these out, then maybe you can help these women because this law wouldn't be here. So he said, Elizabeth, that's not the way to do it. You're gonna to have to get the laws changed. And so from a very early age, she became an activist. So she was very formally educated, uh, much more so than a lot of women, went to a female seminary, which was really kind of a female uh, school, boarding school. Some of, them, uh, some of them were more like finishing schools, studying the fine arts languages, music, and the classics. Uh, she married, and on her honeymoon, she and her husband went to London to an anti-slavery convention. And that's where she met the Mots, who had also traveled from the US to go to this convention. However, the women were not allowed into the convention hall. And this really irritated Lucretia and Elizabeth, and they started plotting uh, the Seneca Falls Convention, and then uh, it happened. 
She was one of the co-founders of the National Women's Suffrage Association and the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And then she co-authored a multi-volume, I believe it's four-volume history of women's suffrage. And she was the author of the Women's Bible, which looked at uh, the Christian religion from a woman's perspective. And you notice I say women's suffrage. That was the term they used. They were also suffragists and not suffragettes. The British women were dubbed suffragettes because they were far more militant, and this was a title that was given to them. And in the US, when, when the suffragists were called suffragettes, it was really meant to paint them with the same brush as these more radical British women, and it was meant to be a derogatory term. So if you hear anyone calling these women suffragettes, correct them, they were suffragists, and that was one of the distinctions between the British and the American movement. Lucretia Coffin Mott, one of the, the co-authors, she was both an abolition and a suffragist, and uh, she helped found Swarthmore College. Uh, Quaker educated, she was a teacher. She became interested in women's rights when she discovered that as a woman teacher, she was making less money than men. Um, and so she, uh, she then married, her husband was a supporter as a, a fellow Quaker, and she experienced violence as a result of some of her anti-slavery activities. She began speaking to promiscuous audiences and was threatened, had things thrown. They threatened to burn down the, the buildings where the, the Grimke sisters spoke, where Lucretia Mott spoke. So there was a lot of violence against these women and against their whole speaking out. She opposed the 14th and 15th Amendments because it left out women. Uh, women really thought after they suspended their activities during the Civil War and concentrated only on abolition and keeping the Union together, that once the uh, African Americans were emancipated, that they would be also. And they expected that in the 14th and 15th Amendments, and it didn't happen. And this began causing some of the splits in the movement. Susan B. Anthony, one of those Quaker women, uh, from Massachusetts, but moved to New York where she was a teacher and she met Elizabeth Cady Stanton, but she met her in terms of their temperance activities. And I've described this movement as being sort of a three-legged stool with abolition, women's rights, and temperance. And at different times, some of that, that stool became unbalanced and one of those legs became a little more important than the other. And then abolition eventually went away but it, it morphed into civil rights. So it still became that three, three prong piece. But Stanton was a, a temperance leader and she was not interested in suffrage or women's rights until she also discovered that she was being paid less than men and then went to a temperance convention in 1853 and wasn't allowed in. So she went back to Stanton and said, you're right, I have to join you and we, you know, if they won't let me in and I'm here leading this temperance cause among women and they won't let me have a voice, it's time for me to, to become active. So that's really what turned her into a suffrage leader. And then she and Stanton were best of friends and worked together for the next 60 years. She was also part of Garrison's group of anti-slavery agents and was very active in, in abolition. She started Revolution, which was one of the first newspapers uh, along with Elizabeth Cady Stanton after the war, that was to motivate women to become involved in, in suffrage and women's rights. So it was one of the first newspapers done by women on the suffrage issue. And then in 1869, help fell in the National Women's Suffrage Association along with, uh, with Stanton and some others. In 1872, she voted illegally, just as Abigail Adams warned was gonna happen. She was tried. She was never, she never paid her fine. She never spent any jail time. And once again, if you have some spare time, uh, the uh, transcript of this trial is online and it's really interesting to read uh, the way that, that they defended her doing this. Elizabeth, Ke Abigail Kelly Foster, another Quaker woman. She was also part of Garrison's movement, another teacher. And she was, uh, her first speech to a mixed audience was also in 1838. So uh, 10 whole years before Seneca Falls, and she was also harassed. Um, she married then in 1854, and her husband was very much uh, one of the financiers of the suffrage movement and was right there with her. She was a little more radical and began splitting from Anthony and Stanton later. Lucy Stone. Uh, Lucy Stone 
maintained her birth name, and women who did not take their husband's name at marriage were referred to as Lucy Stones. And they actually had, in the early 70s, during the second wave of feminism, they issued a stamp uh, in her honor, in Lucy Stone's honor. Um, another Massachusetts, another one well-educated, but she did have a college degree from Oberlin, which was one of the first colleges in the country to allow women to enter. However, they were restricted to what they could study. English language and literature, fine arts, domestic arts, languages, music. Uh, both an abolitionist and a suffragist with Garrison once again. And she was excommunicated from the Congregational Church, and that was when she joined the Quakers because of her public speaking. She violated that document from those Massachusetts uh, ministers. And then she founded the American Equal Rights Association uh, because she really didn't necessarily agree with some of what Stanton and others were, were uh, supporting. And then she began in New Jersey, moved to New Jersey and was very active there. Um, Dr. Hillary Blackwell was her husband and he was also very much a partner in this. He was one of the founders of the Republican Party, and he helped found the AWSA. And he helped publish the Women's Journal with Lucy Stone, his wife. They also came to Kansas. In 1868, when we tried the first time to get a full suffrage amendment, uh, Henry Blackwell and Lucy Stone were here, along with Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and a lot of the other leaders came because they thought they could make Kansas the model. A woman who's been forgotten, and she was basically written out of history by Stanton and Anthony. She was a partner with them, as close a partner with Stanton and Anthony as anyone, uh, was in from the beginning uh, as a hardcore abolitionist, and her, her family had property that was part of the Underground Railroad. She was very well educated. She's the mother of L. Frank Baum, the Wizard of Oz. And she was one of the co-founders of the NWSA, um, she also co-authored The History of Women's Suffrage. She was a very prolific writer, but she became philosophically more radical and she separated from Anthony and Stanton uh, and formed the Women's National Liberal Union. And they literally wrote her out of a lot of the history uh, simply because she didn't think they were moving fast enough. She didn't agree with their tactics. And so she became forgotten. There's a wonderful book, which I found in Wamigo at the Oz Museum called Born Criminal, and it's her biography, and it's fascinating reading. She was one who, along with Stanton, attempted to vote in 1872, and she supported Victoria Woodall, who was the first woman to run for president, and she ran on uh, the Equal Rights Party. Kansas led the way, and woman who was really responsible was Clarina Howard Nichols, who was from Vermont, uh, she tried in Vermont to get the Vermont Constitution changed, and she was booed and told that women shouldn't be speaking. And so she eventually, as an abolitionist, moved to Kansas in the 1850s to help found the state and was a newspaper publisher in the Kansas City area and Quindaro and uh, Wyandotte area. She lobbied the Wyandotte Constitution or convention. She learned a lesson. She did not give speeches in Kansas. She and the other women's rights leaders sat in all the constitutional convention halls and knitted. And then they had refreshments for the men at the breaks and they would lobby them, even though lobbying wasn't a, a term yet. And they basically used the domestic sphere to make their arguments, saying, look, war's coming. We've already got this border war. Men are dying. You're all going to go off to war. We're going to have to run everything. But yet you don't give us the right to own property or control property. You know, we're in charge of your children's education, but we can't vote on the people who run the schools. Uh, we, we really need to have some rights. So in the first, in the 1861 Constitution, she and her, and her other advocates got three provisions into the Kansas Constitution that women could vote in school board elections. So starting in 1861, we became the second state to let women vote in school board elections. Kentucky did, but they only let widows and then they eventually let spinsters with the idea that if you were, had a man in your life, you didn't need to vote. But in Kansas, all women married, whatever, were able to vote. Women could own property after marriage. So if they brought property into a marriage, they could keep it. If they accumulated, they could have control over it. And then judges could consider giving women custody of children. 
Men were the only ones who could file for divorce, but they got the children and the woman was left with nothing. So the judge would determine who got the children. And then after the legislature convened, she got them to agree that when the doors of what is now KU opened, women could study any subject matter. Now we didn't have a law school or a med school at the time in 1866, but women could study anything. And that was a first. We know that Susanna Medora Salter in Argonia was the first woman in the country, probably in the world, who was elected to serve as mayor. And one of the interesting things is a little girl in that town, uh, Nell Nellie Taylor Ross, eventually moved to Wyoming and became the first woman governor in the United States. Wyoming gave women full voting rights as a territory in 1869, so they were ahead of us. By 1900, we had 16 women who'd been mayors. And then uh, we tried, as I said, in uh, 1868, that we had the Populist Party that included its platform. You had Mary Elizabeth Lease raising less corn and more hell, and Annie Diggs, who wrote a column in the Topeka Commonwealth, the Lawrence Journal on suffrage. And then in 1870, some literary societies took up the issue and really began promoting suffrage in Kansas. Division and compromise. Anna Howard Shaw eventually replaced Stanton and um, Anthony as head of the suffrage associations. She was originally from England, uh, eventually lived in Pennsylvania. She was an ordained Methodist preacher, and she also had a doctoral degree in theology. And in the marches that she was in, she would wear her academic robes, her, uh, her mortarboard and her robes, uh, because she was Dr. Anna Howard Shaw. She spent time in Kansas, especially down in Southeast Kansas, where I'm from originally. So she was one of the leaders who came every time we were considering an amendment, she was in, in the state, uh, both a suffragist and a temperance leader. And she brought the temperance leaders into the movement. She gave a speech in 1915 called The Fundamental Principle of the Republic. And it is listed as one of the top 100 speeches of the 20th century at number 27. Alice Paul, one of the later advocates, uh, one of the women who brought it home, clean up batter, whatever metaphor you want to use. She um, was a New Jersey Quaker, was an educator. She moved to London, to England, and as they pointed out in the vote last night, she became involved with the Pankhursts, who were pretty radical, uh, marched there, went to Parliament, and that made her a suffragist for life. She then came back to the US after London, got a PhD uh, in psychology from Penn, the first woman to do so. And then she eventually broke from the National American Women's Suffrage Association. There had been the split, as I said, and you had the national NWSA and the AWSA. They came back together later. And then uh, Anna Howard Shaw did lead that group and Alice Paul was very involved with them. She broke because things were not going fast enough with the state-by-state state approach, and she believed in a national, a federal amendment. And she founded the National Women's Party then in 1916. She was the one who picketed the White House with a group called the Silent Sentinels. They just stood in front of the White House no matter what the weather, and uh, Wilson only gave them 10 minutes at one point, and it took several more years before Wilson finally came around. She proposed the ERA in 1923 after we had suffrage. The photo down here, this is her in her academic robes, just like uh, she wore them frequently too. And then this is Alice Paul up in the balcony, and this is the banner that has each state and the star when they ratified. And she hung the banner when we got the last state and then finally had the, uh, on August 26, 1920, this photo was taken and then her supporters down below. This is a picture of the Silent Sentinels. And you can't see it very well, but this woman over here has a banner that says University of Kansas, and she might have been Iris Catterwall, but I'm not sure. And there's somebody from the University of Missouri. Women came from all over. And at this point, Kansas had the vote in 1912. We got full suffrage. So you had Kansas women coming in to try to do something for the national movement. Frances Willard, another important person who was a temperance leader, another teacher, founded one of the founders of WCTU. And she also basically brought hundreds of thousands of women into the suffrage movement. But later they became a liability when the, the anti-prohibition forces said, if we give women the vote, we're gonna have prohibition. They were right. 
Um, and so Kat later asked her to step away and because she was hurting the movement. Then we have the founder of the League of Women Voters, Carrie Lane Chapman Kat, who uh, has a center named after her at Iowa State. One of my former grad students is the associate director. One of my best friends is just recently retired as the inaugural director of the Kat Center to study women in politics. Uh, Iowa State graduate teacher, she was a school superintendent, and she succeeded Anthony as president of the, uh, the NAWSA. She was also in there, kind of she and Shaw sort of traded off times of being head of the organization. She was very instrumental in getting the 19th Amendment passed. Paul used the silent sentinels and her protests and was put in jail in a workhouse, went on a hunger strike, a force fed her, tied her to a chair, put this device in her mouth, opened her, her throat, and then put raw eggs and other proteins down so that she couldn't starve and become a martyr. That got attention. Wilson began paying more attention. Congress began paying more attention, but it was Carrie Chapman Catt who was having dinner with Wilson, who was going to the leaders in Congress who used diplomacy to finally get the vote in Congress that put it uh, up to the states for ratification, and then afterwards formed the League of Women Voters. African American women were incredibly important in this movement, going all the way back to Maria Miller Stewart, but haven't probably gotten as much credit. A couple, just two of them, I probably have 20 I could name, but I'm about out of time here. Mary Church Terrell, one of the major leaders of both the suffrage and black club movements. And the black women's clubs were the ones who promoted suffrage for black women. She was also an Orberlin graduate because they, like KU, uh, were fully integrated with both women and African Americans uh, when, after the war. Uh, she was the first black woman who was appointed to the DC school board. And she had a major role in speaking at NAWSA conventions. And then she uh, participated in the segregated 1913 suffrage parade where Alice Paul didn't want the black women to participate because it was going to antagonize the Southerners and who didn't want women voting at all, didn't want black men voting. So they basically showed up and marched anyway. And then Ida B. Wells Barnett, who is also prominently mentioned last night, uh, who was a journalist, an incredible leader of, of the movement, uh, also a college graduate, a teacher, she published a book that, on lynching that really brought this to the broad attention of the American public. And she started the Alpha Suff Suffrage Club, which was the first black women's club solely devoted to suffrage. And she marched in 1913, but she refused to go to the back of the line. And then she published voter education materials. Two people who were incredibly important and got this finally on on the books were Phoebe and Harry Byrne. Feb Byrne, who was the mother of Harry Byrne. Harry Byrne was 24 years old, first term legislator in Tennessee. Tennessee put it over the top. He wore the red carnation of the opposition on the day that they were going to have the vote. And they tried twice to table whether or not they were going to adopt the amendment. And Feb was up in the gallery and she sent Carry a note that said hurrah and vote for suffrage. And then it also said put the rat in ratification for Mrs. for Mrs. Cat. Very clever. He then voted the way his mother suggested he should. Pandemonium, because he put it over the top. All of the people who thought he was going to vote their way felt, you know, like he'd been a traitor. He ran out, went and hid in his office. He never ran for public office again. Um, but he, he definitely, Phoebe and Harry Byrne, got Tennessee over the top. There's a picture of Mott, Anthony, and Stanton that's in the Capitol. It's sat in a closet, basically, in the basement of the Capitol for decades. It was finally moved up in the 90s. And then this is a statue in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, they This was... I took this two years ago before the plaza was finished, but over by the Parthenon, they're voting, they're devoting an entire plaza to the, there being the state that put it over the top into the 100th anniversary and it's open now. So that is my presentation. And I will uh, now be happy for, you can make comments or 
ask questions, whatever you would like to do, and I'll take a look at the chat. Anything from me in there yet? No. If you want, if you want to just raise your hand and I'll unmute you if you want to make a comment or ask a question. I went through a lot of history very quickly and believe me, this is the tip of the iceberg. There are hundreds of women who we should be talking about and men. Anyone waving? Okay. Oh, um, Lisa asked everybody, um, what is a good starting place for introducing school age kids to these role models and change agents? I think we should start doing it in it, you know, kindergarten. Uh, a lot of schools now during Women's History Month have kids doing things. I have been, I also do a lot of work on first ladies. I've written about five or six book chapters on various first ladies. And I did a program a few years ago for a kindergarten class in Florida that was studying famous women. And they had me on to talk about Eleanor Roosevelt. And these kids were doing great. Uh, my little granddaughter who uh, just turned five, she'll start kindergarten, her preschool also did something on women's history. And she read something from the Michelle Obama speech and they sent me the video of it. Uh, so I don't think it's too early uh, even preschool, there are a lot of really great children's books on women now. If you really go online and go to Amazon, you're going to find, you know, board books. Start them from the beginning, is my, my thinking. Can't do it soon enough. I already bought one of my granddaughters. I bought her a onesie at the National Archives with the We Can Do It uh, when she was, you know, six months old. And, and she was a preemie, so she didn't wear it until she was a year. But she'll wear that when she's with me with her We Can Do It. So start them early. Um, any others? Okay, well if not, thank you again. Uh, if you have a chance to watch the vote, do it. Um, like I said, I learned something watching it a second time last night, some things I've missed. It is just packed full of information too. And um, I'll be out there voting with everybody else and my husband and I are going to start doing postcards. Uh, there's an organization that's having people write postcards from home to get out the vote. We're going to start doing that. So keep up the great work. And thanks Excellent. again for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, let, me, um, let me make just a couple of announcements because um, actually our league, um, we, we've hit the three big topics of 2020, beginning with uh, uh, Diana Carlin's presentation um, about suffrage and the centennial um, of the 19th Amendment. Next month, Tuesday Topics in August, we'll be speaking with Shawnee County Public Health Director, Linda Oaks. Uh, and in September, we will be speaking with uh, Chief of Police, Chief of, Chief of Police Chief Bill Cochran. Um, so we're hitting the three big topics, bing, bing, bing. So good for us. Uh, thank you, Diana. It's been wonderful. Uh, any, any other questions or comments before we um, leave for today? If not, thank you again. Thank Always you. fun to talk about this. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks so much. <laughs>